back a couple pages to hymn 214, hymn 214. Good Christian men rejoice. Let's do 213. 213. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Wabash Church. Invite you to stand with us as we continue our time of worship this morning with some familiar carols. Oh 
strife. Joyful music leaves us sunward in the triumph song of life. Oh, 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 in excelsis day. Good morning, Wabash Church. Good morning. Everybody awake? There you go. There you go. Great to see you this morning. Thank you for coming and being here and giving us an opportunity to worship together this morning. I um, want to, first of all, uh, invite our children to be dismissed. Ordinarily, it is not this early, but if you've been with us these last couple of weeks, we've dismissed the kids early so they can go and work on some of the music that they're going to be doing uh, on some of the future Sundays and Christmas Eve. So let's um, have a prayer for our kids as they depart and head off to that in the children's church. Father, we thank you for our children. We thank you for those who have stepped up to volunteer to lead them. And we pray your blessing on them and upon the children as they rehearse this morning and as they go off to children's church as well. Be present uh, in, uh, in their classrooms this morning and surround them with your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. So kids can be dismissed. If you are a guest this morning, there's a card that looks a little something like this in your pew. We'd love for you to fill it out and uh, drop it off in the uh, offering box, which is just outside, or you can take it to the welcome kiosk, which is over by the front doors. That would give us a chance to greet you. It's a chance to welcome you and uh, just connect with you. Promise we won't put you on a junk mail list and fill your box with all kinds of stuff that you don't need from us. But it is our way of connecting with you and would love the opportunity to do that. So fill out that blue card if you would. I want to share a verse with you this morning as uh, we continue to worship. This is from Isaiah chapter 9, one of the great verses uh, of the Advent season. It says this, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You know, I look out this morning and it's just so great to see brilliant sunshine. This time of year in the Northwest, as you are fully aware, you never quite know when you're gonna get a morning like this. And so you kinda need to grab it. And I don't know how your life is going uh, these days, but I know for some people, they've really struggled with some darkness in their lives, darkness in, uh, in things that are going on in the news around us. And so for them, hopefully, this is a verse that brings them hope. And maybe for you this morning as well. If there's some darkness in your life, if there's something that you just kind of feel as though you're battling, I hope that you might lean upon God's word this morning and as we jump into it a little bit later and as we come to the table to receive the elements of communion, that you might sense God's presence and that for you, this verse might be a reality that on them, the light has shined. As we're together this morning, we know that we worship the one who said that he is the light of the world. And so that is why we're together. And this morning, just as it's brilliant sunshine outside, brilliant sunshine in our hearts as the Lord shines upon us. And so this morning, I invite you to continue to worship and allow his light to shine upon you this morning as we gather together for worship. Thank you for being here. Welcome to Wabash Church. Angels from Yeah. 
shepherds.
Father, we bring you praise this morning. We thank you for your goodness to us. Receive our prayers this morning, and we thank you for the grace that you pour out upon us. We thank you and we praise you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. A couple things just to let you know this morning in terms of uh, announcements. Right after this service this morning, we begin a brand new adult class that is going to happen over in the library. It's an adult class uh, entitled simply Advent, um, and it is uh, a class uh, of uh, J.D. Greer, who uh, is a pastor uh, in the Carolinas and uh, shares a, a great ministry there, and it's our opportunity to hear from uh, him and so I hope that you'll join us this morning, starting uh, right after worship, we'll be over in the library. There'll be one adult class for the, uh, the time period of Advent from now until uh, uh, through the 19th, um, and so join us for that. Also, I wanna let you know that next Sunday morning, uh, there is a congregational meeting right after worship. It's our annual meeting to elect deacons and elders and nominating committee. So right after worship and before Sunday school next week, we will do that here uh, in the sanctuary. Also, Sally asked me uh, to let choir know that your rehearsal is going to be on Thursday as opposed to Wednesday this week. So if you're part of the choir uh, for Christmas, just keep that in mind. Rehearsal is Thursday uh, as opposed to Wednesday. Uh, the Deacon's Giving Tree is in the lobby this morning. An opportunity for you to help Plateau Outreach Ministries. Uh, you'll see a number of different tags on the tree um, asking for things like paper towels and um, cleaning supplies and all kinds of different things. I think there's some toys and so forth for kids as well. So just check out the giving tree, grab one of the tags um, and purchase whatever is on the tag and then you can bring that back here to the church uh, and place the gift under the tree along with the tag. That would be great helpful, uh, helpful for us. And then lastly, uh, or actually two more announcements. One is Christmas Eve. We want to make sure that you're making plans to join us. Christmas Eve service at 4 p.m. on the 24th, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It'll be our usual candlelight service. And I know the kids are singing that night. Um, and uh, it'll just be a, a great opportunity to worship the Lord and to be able to do so early enough so that you can get on home and uh, have uh, dinner with your family and so forth. So Christmas Eve, just make plans to join us at 4 o'clock. Invite friends uh, to come with you. Maybe you've got a neighbor or two or a work associate uh, that you'd like to uh, um, invite. Do so for Christmas Eve. And lastly, there is an insert for poinsettias. If you would like to either honor or, um, uh, or remember someone, uh, a loved one perhaps that's passed, you can fill that out and drop that in the offering or, uh, or just uh, slide it under the office doors. And hello, Zach. Yeah, just uh, don't mind. Uh, no, come, come on up. Did you want to do announcements? Um, uh, yeah. Sermon, perhaps. <laughs> Maybe you'd like to preach. Oh, well. Yeah, we'll leave that. Checking if this is working here. Seems so, um, yeah, you know, a little bit of announcement here. I'm here representing the... Uh, well, hi, ladies. The... the um, Come on up. <laughs> the personnel committee. Thank and, you so uh, much, we, Carol. And uh, we wanted to uh, think about this day being uh, Pastor Appreciation Day. Well, thank you. And uh, pastors and pies kind of go together. 
And uh, perhaps so, a little uh, too many. You notice the <laughs> button is not there. Let's. So we. Uh, there we go. This is your your special day. So we really wanted to have you well prepared, and uh, to do that, um, we wanted to present you with a, a bib. <laughs> So, oh, you've, uh, you've seen me eat. Yes, uh, some, uh, so when, you know, you're, you want to protect your Sunday best, mm -hmm. and uh, so this will protect it, and then when, you know, all that is going in, just give her a wipe, you know, so we'll start with that. <laughs> well, thank you. Also, um, knowing that um, you really like the pies, and this congregation has made some great pies, we want mm. to give you a properly sized nice. place to get the, the extra stuff on. And uh, as this is um, your special day, a special fork. Special fork, wow. Bet. So hopefully thank, that gets you, you set. And um, I'd like to um, also comment that we do have more than one pastor, but there is actually another pastor appreciation day coming up on the 26th. So we will get Ben in due time. Um, Does he that, get a bib, or do I, do I need to keep this for him? Or? We, will, we will custom design it for each pastor oh, oh, wow. as needed. So, well, thank uh, you. And uh, so, do you want to go ahead and present the gift? Pastor George, these are from the congregation. Um, oh, some gifts and notes and um, just everybody is, thanks the Lord for you and we appreciate you and yeah. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And one, one last thing, this is Pastor George's special day, but everybody's invited. It's a big pie thing after the... Yeah, after I, I can't eat it all, and uh, as much as I may like to try. Wow, well, thank you, Zach. Let's, let's do this. Well, thank you so much, and um, I just want you to know how much I appreciate you uh, and appreciate the opportunity that the Lord has given uh, Elizabeth and me over the last 11 years to share with you and uh, to bring you God's word. And I want you to know how much I appreciate the staff that you've allowed me to have and um, uh, really could not, do, uh, can, could not do what we do week by week by week without um, uh, such a great team to serve with. So. Uh, thank you to you for allowing us to serve together and, uh, and to minister together. And I um, want you to know how much I appreciate you and, and all that you do. So thank you so much. And yes, come have pie. Because I can't eat all of that. But I might like to try. You know, one of the things also that you have in your bulletin um, is something that says um, fasting focus. And I believe uh, this is week four of Fasting Focus. If that's new to you, if you've not been with us uh, over the course of the last, uh, the last few weeks, um, our church is desiring to hear God's voice and wanting to know where God is leading us as we look forward and uh, as we fill some of the vacancies that we have on our staff. We want to make sure that we're doing what the Lord has called us to. And so um, a, n a number of folks in the congregation have been a part of this fasting focus for the last uh, four weeks now as we've been uh, praying and fasting together as the Lord has led us uh, to seek his face and his direction for our church. And so uh, we have made as a part of our Sunday morning routine uh, the singing of uh, a song by Keith and, and uh, Kristen Getty. Uh, entitled Speak, O Lord, as that's our desire, is to hear God speak. And so this morning, once again, we'll join our voices together uh, and make this a prayer that'll lead into our pastoral prayer this morning. So would you stand with me this morning and let's uh, join our voices together and speak, O Lord. Shut up. 
heights of your plans for us. Truths unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And by grace we'll stand on your promises and by Please be seated and let's continue our hearts in prayer this morning. Father, it's our desire to hear you speak, and especially in this time in the life of our church. Because we know you have much to say to us, and so it's our desire to posture ourselves to await your word to us. Speak to us, speak to the leadership of our church, allow us to hear your voice hear your direction. And we thank you that you're the God who steps forward in the book of Isaiah to give us a sign. You're so intent that we know how you are moving so that we might do so in concert with you. And so, Lord, just as you gave your son as a sign of your love to your people, so we too await what you would show us. You're also the God of forgiveness. And you're the God who beckons us to come to you in our brokenness and in our sin, to be cleansed by you. And you ask only that we would confess our sins, and then you tell us that you will be faithful, and you're just, and so because of that, you forgive us. And so, Lord, in these next few moments of silence, we come to confess before you. Would you hear our prayers as we come into your presence this morning. This morning, Lord, there are those in our church family who need your presence in their lives. Some, Lord, are struggling with health this day some, Lord, appear to be nearing the end of their days that you have granted them. And so, Lord, we ask for your perfect timing and for your sovereign will to be fulfilled in their lives. Lord, some are still dealing with the effects of the COVID-19 virus. Some are battling other respiratory issues. And Lord, in all of these cases, would you show yourself to be the great healer and would you use these various issues to draw them all closer to your side? Lord, as we come to your word this morning and then as we make our way to the table, we ask that you would convey to us your grace. Would you speak to our hearts and remind us of the depth of your sacrifice on our behalf? Would you remind us of your love for us the greatness of your gift of forgiveness. For this and for all that we've mentioned, we want to give you thanks this morning. And we do so in the name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, in the movie... All the President's Men, there's a scene in which one of the main characters, either Woodward or Bernstein, I can't remember which one it was, 
one played by Robert Redford, one played by Dustin Hoffman. The character is on the phone with one of the members of President Nixon's cabinet. And Woodward and Bernstein, of course, are the reporters from the Washington Post who were catapulted into celebrity status for breaking the Watergate story. And as they're talking with this source who's very close to the president, they're trying to get him to either confirm or deny a lead that they're planning to run in the next day's edition of the Washington Post. And the source that they're talking to on the phone, for obvious reasons, is reluctant to say anything. He doesn't want to commit one way or the other and, and have as part of the record what it is that he says. And so one of the reporters comes up with a method for the source to confirm the tip and either deny or agree to what is being said. And he suggests this. The reporter says, I'll ask a question, and then I'm going to count to 10. And if you say nothing at all, then for all intents and purposes, you are denying the story that I'm going to run with. And so the reporter counts to 10, and the source says absolutely nothing. And then he waits just a bit and then says, do you have your answer? As the reporter is then recounting to the other reporter how he got the source to deny the story without saying anything, he says, it was a non-denial denial. It becomes a famous phrase throughout the movie, that and follow the money. In other words, what was not said was the story. That which was not said became the story. The same could be said, I believe, about the Gospel of Mark when it comes to talking about the birth of Jesus Christ. Remember from last week, we spoke of the fact that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all differ in how they report the events of the life of Jesus. Do you recall how we shared that last Sunday and I inadvertently offended all of the Ford owners last week when I made a, a very callous and unthinking quip about F-150s? But the fact that the writers of all of the Gospels differ one from another says something about the message behind the message. Why does Mark not say what he doesn't say, as we'll take a look at in just a moment. Why does Matthew say what he says? Why does Luke, why do John, why are the authors intent in saying things a certain way? There's got to be something in that that informs what we believe about the Gospels. Or in this case with the Gospel of Mark, the message is the non-message. You see, I think there's a reason that Mark leaves out of the, his gospel any reference to the birth of Jesus. And as we said last week, the fact that Mark differs from John, who differs from Matthew, who differs from Luke, the, fa the mere fact that they are different from one from another says nothing about the authority of the word but it does tell us something about the message that the author is trying to convey. And so with that, this morning we want to examine Mark's gospel with this intent. Why is there no birth narrative, Mark? What is the story in the non-story? So if you would grab your Bible and open with me to the very first pages of the Gospel of Mark. So it's the second book of the New Testament, the Gospel according to Mark, and look at the very first verse. Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Why no, gospel, why no account of the birth narrative? The story is in what isn't said in this case. So before we get into that, let me tell you just a few things about the Gospel of Mark. Most scholars and a good, num good number of the early church fathers, people like Irenaeus and Justin Martyr and so forth, 
dating back to the very first century, believe that while Mark is most likely the author of the gospel, the source of the majority of the information probably has come from Peter and not Mark. Mark functioned perhaps more as a scribe of Peter's. There's a very close relationship between Mark and Peter, so much so that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, Peter refers to Mark as my son. So they were very tight. And it's thought that it was to the home of John Mark and his mother Mary that Peter went once he was released from prison in Jerusalem, and that the early church actually met in the home of John Mark and his mother Mary. So given that, seeing that Mark was not one of the named disciples, but of course Peter was, the information that's in the gospel account would bear the accuracy you'd expect from a first-hand narrator like Peter in this case. So Mark, the author of what Peter basically told him and recounted for him. And so how does this first-hand description begin? Well, if you look at it, you'll notice that it begins with the beginning. Look at Mark 1, verse 1. It says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then he goes on to quote Isaiah. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Note that he doesn't say the beginning of of Jesus. It's the beginning of the gospel, he says. The be beginnings of the eugalion in Greek. The good news, the glad tidings. Mark begins his gospel not with a description of the birth of Jesus, but he begins with the beginnings of the good news. The preparation for salvation. And he's going to go on and quote then from Isaiah. Here's the good news, he says. Something is being prepared. He says the beginning of the gospel or the good news of Jesus. The preparation for what's to come. We just had seven of our eight grandchildren with us for varying amounts of time over the course of the week leading up to Thanksgiving. Seven kids ranging in age from 12 on down to eight months. And in various parental figures to these seven kids, there were days when it was just a zoo in our living room with kids and parents and so forth. But the preparation that it took to get ready for that was what the real zoo looked like. There was the dismantling of the bunk beds so that we would have two twin beds down on the same level. There was the purchase of and then the assembly of a new junior bed for one of the grandkids. There was the locating and the putting up of the porta crib There was the scheduling of airport runs. Lots of preparations, all to get ready for this big event of Thanksgiving. And that's just exactly how Mark's gospel begins. You see, while the birth narrative of the Savior is important, this is Mark saying, I'm going to start with the preparation for that event. And so he goes on to quote, from the prophecies of Malachi and of Isaiah, written seven to eight hundred years before the time of Jesus. And God says, through these men, through these prophets, I'm sending my messenger, who's revealed later to be John the Baptist, as the one who is the preparer. And what does the work of preparation look like here? He says, Prepare to make his paths straight. That's his preparatory plea. 
make his paths straight. You see, in the ancient world, there would have been an envoy of the king that would go ahead and make sure the roads were in good shape, kind of advance men, if you would. And with the absence of the birth narrative in Mark's gospel, it shows that the real beginnings, excuse me, that the real beginnings of the good news are found in the preparation for the coming Messiah. Again, look at Mark chapter 1. In the beginning of the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written by Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. This is the beginning for Mark. So let me ask you two questions this morning. First of all, for those of you that might not yet have put your faith in Jesus Christ, might you see that this season is a time of preparation for you to see the legitimacy of the Savior? Maybe there has been in your life much that has led you to this particular day. And hearing the gospel message, perhaps for the second, third, or even fourth time, and perhaps the straight path that he's making is a straight path into your heart this morning. Or for those of you that are already Christ followers, with whom are you having conversations about the Lord that the Lord might use to prepare someone's heart for that good news? You see, here is Mark saying the preparation for the glad tidings began way back with Isaiah and with Malachi. The beginnings of the gospel on preparing a way. Secondly, I'd like you to see this morning that the absence of a birth narrative and any kind of genealogy in Mark chapter 1 also highlights the servant nature of Jesus. Simply put, the pedigree of a servant was of no interest to anyone in this day and age because servants were property. They weren't people. And we're not saying this to demean somehow the personhood of Jesus, but it does illustrate Mark's depiction of Jesus as a servant. The fact that there's no genealogy paints the picture of Jesus' servant nature. And it fits with chapter 10, verse 45 of Mark's gospel, when Mark says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And in the very first chapter where you would expect there to be a birth narrative, instead you have a picture of humility right from the very start that shows the servant heart of Jesus. In verse 9, Jesus himself is baptized by John. And the text reads like this, In those days... Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. I love what one author pointed out about this. He talked about the very common nature of the name Jesus. He talked about the unremarkable, despised village of Nazareth. He talked of the unspiritual region of Galilee, hardly viewed as the Bible belt of that area. He spoke of the act of baptism as a way of Jesus identifying with sinful mankind. And the fact that he was baptized in the Jordan, which was often a very unpleasant place. In fact, in the Mishnah, which is the early rabbinic writings of the time, the Jordan River was actually disqualified for rituals of purity and cleansing because the water was so impure. So all of this, the commonness, of all of this points to the identification of Jesus with the human nature that he has come to serve, not to be served. 
So the absence of the birth narrative and that being replaced with the baptism of Jesus shows Jesus' servant nature to us. And lastly, with a lack of the birth narrative, the story of what isn't there, there also appears to be an underlying sense of Mark saying, let's just get on with things. See, it's not always apparent in the English, but in the Greek, Mark uses a certain tense whereby he communicates that everything is very active and there's always a sense of movement. In fact, the word immediately, which some translators convey with the word straight away, appears over 40 times in Mark's gospel. In fact, to highlight the active nature of the gospel, Ralph Martin, who was a New Testament professor at Fuller Seminary, wrote a study guide called Where the Action Is. And it was a study guide of the gospel of Mark. It was R Ralph Martin's way of saying everything moves at a fever pitch in Mark's gospel. And the structure of the first chapter hints at that as well. You have the presence of John the Baptist announcing the coming of Jesus. You have Jesus' baptism and his temptation and then his inauguration into public ministry. And all of that happens straight away. Mark's gospel is one that's active and moving swiftly. And we've got to be careful not to read too much into this, but I do sense a nudge to take a similar approach to my own life and my own ministry by this example of Mark. Do you ever sometimes feel as though the Lord is saying to you, as I think he's saying through this gospel, it's time to just get on with it and get moving? You know, quite honestly, I have felt that way with all that's gone on with COVID. And I'm not saying ignore this or ignore that, but when it comes to the activity of the gospel, I sometimes feel as though COVID has dictated the passion for ministry for some of us. But let's not be careless, let's not be reckless, but let's do get on with it. And like Jesus here in this gospel account, let's get on with serving. As I shared with you a few weeks back, I believe it's time for us to get on with touching the community, with making disciples who make disciples, with turning our eyes outward into how we can serve. Because as his followers, we too sense that call not to be served, but to serve others because he gave his life as a ransom for many. I believe the fact that the birth narrative doesn't appear in Mark's gospel is a way of Mark saying, let's get on with ministry. Let's, let's fast forward to where we're touching lives because that's what Jesus did. The one who came not to be served, but to serve others. And that's really the message of the table that's behind me. And this morning, we have our opportunity to come and to receive from him, to receive the gift of God's grace through this meal. In fact, it was when Jesus was together with his disciples that he took bread. And after he gave thanks for it, he broke it. And he said to them, this is my body which is given for you. He said, do this in remembrance of me. The same manner also he took the cup and after he had given thanks for it, he poured it out. And he said, this is the new covenant which is sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And it was Paul, as he wrote to the church at Corinth, who said, as often as you do this, as often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you're proclaiming the Lord's death until that moment that he comes again. And so this morning, we have our opportunity to receive from him as well. If you are not a member of Wabash Church, we want you to know that this table is the table of Jesus Christ. It's not the Wabash table. 
So you need to be a member to come and receive. We do ask, though, that Jesus Christ be the Lord of your life and that as you come forward to receive these elements, you're doing so because of our common bond in Jesus Christ. For some, they would like to utilize what we call almost kind of a self-service communion, and they're set up on the tables here. It's the juice and the wafer all put together in one cup. If you are more comfortable receiving those, simply come down the outside aisles. But down here in the front, we'll have elders that will have bread and the cup that you can come and receive from there. We ask, too, that as you receive the elements and as you head back to your pew, that if you would go ahead and receive the wafer or the piece of bread that is on the tray, but would you hang on to your cup and retain that, and we'll partake of that all together, and that will symbolize our unity in Jesus Christ. Would you join your hearts in prayer with me as we prepare for this meal? Father, we're grateful that you have given to us this example. We thank you for how we have seen uh, in your word this morning that the non-presence of a birth narrative in Mark's gospel points to the servant nature of Jesus. And it's our desire, Lord, to live our lives in such a way that we mirror that. And so this morning as we receive this meal, might you convey to us your grace so that then we might take your grace and serve others as our Lord did. Father, be present in this meal as we receive it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Those of you that are serving with me, elders, would you come forward? And as we prepare ourselves, then we'll invite you to come and receive.
nor earth sustain. Heaven and earth shall flee away when he comes to reign. In the bleak midwinter, a stable place sufficed for the Christ. Gloria, Gloria, now my eyes have seen. So What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, So Mark writes at the beginning of his gospel. He says, <clears throat> the beginnings of the gospel, the beginnings of the good news is that God was preparing us to receive the gift of salvation. God bless you as you have your opportunity to receive that this morning through the shed blood of Jesus. Would you stand with me as we close our worship together?
Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Doug and Sharon. I want to give you the opportunity this morning, if you need prayer, to come forward. There'll be a couple of elders here in the front that would love a chance to pray with you. Please join us out in the lobby. I hear tell that there is pie out there circulating around, so come and join us for that. And then make your way in for the adult class at 11. Again, we'll be in the library. One class for uh, adults during Advent the class on Advent, and that'll happen in the library this morning. So now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. <laughs> 